You see, at just the right time, when we were utterly helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Us. The fact that our God demonstrated his love towards us means that it is actions which support, line up, and stand together with one another in order to establish, show, and prove that something is a fact. It is a fact that God has demonstrated his love for us. And it is a fact that he did so while we were yet sinners. Meaning that we were depraved, detestable, and devoted to sin. Therefore, it speaks to each of us who were at one point of our lives spiritually lost because we fell short of the glory of God, both in life and character. And that's why I want to call your attention briefly this morning to Micah chapter 7. Verses 18 and 19, where Micah, who was known as God's prophet of the poor, and a contemporary with the prophet Isaiah, during the reigns of the three kings of Judah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, Michael prophesies for the distinct purpose of outlining God's complaint against his people. And I wonder, I just wonder if God has a complaint against you and I today. The outline of God's complaint was telling them exactly what God had against them, what they had sinfully committed against his laws, and then what the Lord intended to do about their corruption. So understand that in this book of Micah, and I'm just setting the tone, I'm setting the stage for what we're about to get into. This book of Micah and this prophecy of Micah, Micah by inspiration of the Holy Spirit illustrates and he pictures the Lord God in four critical ways. The first picture is that he is the judge. Amen, somebody. Second picture is that he is the God of justice and righteousness. Third picture is that he is the God who loves peace. Then the fourth picture is that he is the God of hope and promises. And that's where we're going to focus on for this morning. 
is that he is the God of hope and promises. You see, Micah helps you and I to be reminded of the fact that even in times of our hopelessness and despair, we can still look unto God with hope. And we can still look unto God with hope because of his faithfulness to his promises. This is why Micah says in Micah 7 in the verses 5 through 7, because times are going to get tough in, in you and my life. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. If you're living in this life, there will be days where it is tough. Amen, somebody. Micah 7, 5 through 7, he says, In times such as these, do not trust in a friend. Amen, somebody. We're living in days where you can't even trust family members, those closest to you. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Uh, people who smile in your face, but all the time they want to take your place. Are they called backstabbers? Oh yeah, okay. Amen, somebody. He says, guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. In other words, even sometimes with our spouses, we have to be careful what we say. Amen, somebody. Why is this? For son dishonors father. Daughter rises against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy are the men of his own household. Yes, this could have been written yesterday. But, he says, but as for me, here's the point. But as for me, even in conditions such as this, the prophet says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but as for me, I will look in hope to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Amen, somebody. You see, Micah is saying even when times go from bad to worse, I'm going to put my faith and trust in him. Even when times go from bad to worse, I'm going to depend and rely upon him. And even when times go from being bad to worse, I'm going to patiently, patiently allow him to lead the way because I'm assured that deliverance comes from him and him alone and from no other source. You see, God allows you and I to go through some things so that we can use up all of our so-called resources. And as Willie pointed out earlier, so that we can learn to rely solely on the source and stop trying to go to resources. And this is why lamentations, because sometimes these things, as I always point out to you, and I know you say you're always harping on those things, because it's the truth. These things get emotional. These things become mental. Amen, somebody. And we struggle in these areas. Amen, somebody. And sometimes we struggle in these areas, and, and we are so busy trying to camouflage 
and cover up what we're experiencing because we don't want somebody to think that we're not strong enough or that we're weak or that we can't hang or we can't take care of our own issues. But the truth is, the, the truth is, the matter the, of the matter is, Satan is trying to destroy you and I. And what better way to destroy us than to get us to destroy our own selves? And this is why Lamentations, Book of Lamentations, chapter 3, in the verses 20 through 23 says, the prophet says this, I will never forget this awful time. When is the last time you've had an awful time in your life? We don't forget the awful times, do we? They stick with us. I will never forget this awful time as my soul is discouraged and depressed within me. But notice, yet I call this to mind. In other words, even in my discouragement, even in my depression, there's something I call to my remembrance. And we would be, behoove us to, to do this because sometimes we're just in a funk for months on, on end. Is that all right? He says, yet I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Is that all right? It is because of the Lord's great mercies or great love that we are not consumed. Did y'all get that? In other words, whatever you and I go through, it would have been took us out if it wasn't for God's great love and mercies. You say, man, I'm, it's, it's tough right now. It would have been took you out if it hadn't been for God. Because his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Notice this. Great is your faithfulness. You see, even when you and I get to a point where the enemy has convinced us to give up our hope in God, isn't it wonderful to know that God never gives up on us? Second Timothy 2.13 says, even if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny who he is. And this is why Micah chapter 7 in verse 18, get this now. Micah 7, 18, the prophet by inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, who is a God like you? We can stop just right there. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Now notice this. Y'all ready? There's three critical things that you and I need to note about this statement, who is a God like you? Three things, and this lesson will be ours. Who is a God like you? Number one, what we need to note is that there is no one absolutely no one who can compare to God. 
That's number one. So understand, who is a God like you? Micah is saying that it can never be said that God is like blank. Or God is like blank. Because there is no one that God is like. And no one who is like God. Are y'all getting this? And this is why Exodus 15, 11 reminds us after God had parted the Red Sea. Amen, somebody, y'all remember that? Moses said in his song in Exodus 15, 11, he said, Who is like you, O Lord, among the mighty ones? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. 2 Samuel 7.22 says, Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Psalm 89 in verses 6 and 7 says, For who in all of heaven can compare with the Lord. What mightiest angel is anything like the Lord? God is greatly to be feared and reverently worshipped in the assembly of the holy angelic ones. He is far more awesome than all who surround his throne. Jeremiah 10.6 then says, Lord, there is no one like you, for you are great, and your name is mighty in power. You see, Micah would know that no one is like God, because his name, Micah, means who is like Jehovah. There is something in the name. Amen, somebody. Don't tell me uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. Words, names have a purpose. Amen, somebody. Micah name means who is like Jehovah. So therefore, it is fitting that when he closes this prophecy, this book, he closes it with a message that's very similar in definition, very definition, and meaning of his own name. Is that all right? Because that's truly, when you look at Micah, the prophecy, the book, that's truly the theme of the entire book is who is there like God? Notice then number two. Number two, we want to look at the reason, the reason, the reason why there is no one who is like God. Okay? He asks again, who is a God like you? Did y'all get that? Who is a God like you? Who pardons? sin and forgives the transgressions. Notice, after he asks who is a God like you, he does not say who has made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is therein, in accordance to Exodus 20 and verse 11. Notice he didn't say who is a God like you who counts the stars and calls them by name. It's in accordance to Psalm 147 and the verse number four. Notice he says, when he says, who is a God like you? He does not say who created or formed the mountains by his strength, showing his mighty power in accordance to Psalm 65 and the verse six. No, he doesn't say any of those things. But rather, he says, who is a God like you 
who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Did y'all get that? Don't miss that. He could have said all these other things, who does this, who does that, who does this, but he chooses to say, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Now, let me just pause just for a second here, because the fact of the matter is this. This is so incomprehensible that it's not always truly considered by you and I as it should. That's why it's quiet right now. Amen, somebody. I was just talking about this both with my wife and with Mervyn earlier. Sometimes what God has done for you and I is so awesome that it just goes over our head. It escapes us completely. We can't even really take time to contemplate, to really consider what God has done for us. All right? We have so much going on in our lives. Amen, somebody. So many things we got to do, so many places we have to be, amen, somebody, that we don't even take time out of each and every day, just a moment to consider what God has done for us. You see, this statement right here, when he says, who is a God like you, who pardons sin, Amen, someone who forgives. It's just so phenomenal that we fail to realize that no one, and here's the point, no one can, can, can be compared to Jehovah because greater is God's work of redemption than that of even creation. Y'all will get it when you get home. It amazes us how God said, let there be, and it was. We can't even fathom that, that God spoke in existence something from nothing. That's creation. That's true creation. True creation is creating something from nothing. Amen, somebody. And that's what God get, did. He created something out of nothing just by his word. But what's even more phenomenal than that, what's even a greater work than that, is the fact that he has redeemed you and I from our sin. Amen, somebody. And this is why Psalm 103 in the verses 1 through 4 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Notice, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Dropping down to verse 10 through 14 in the same chapter of Psalm 103, he says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. 
As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. You see, just to sum up this second point, the fact that redemption is the greater work of God is evident in the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It didn't say for God so loved the world that he created something. Y'all will get that when you get home. And therefore our sins, our sins can never outweigh God's love for us. Isn't that good news? 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Then finally, number three, not only when we look at who is a God like you, do we look at the reason, but we want to look at the basis on which there is no one like God. Not just the reason, but the basis. In other words, what is it based on? Amen, somebody. Understand that God's pardon and forgiveness is based not upon your and my merits. There's nothing that you and I can do in and of ourselves to merit what God has done, to deserve what God has done, to be worthy of what God has done. But it is of his own mercy. Is that all right? The basis is upon his own mercy. And therefore, when we are truly repentant, amen, somebody, and we receive that mercy that has been freely given to us, we should never grow weary or faint of the great and wonderful love that God has for us. You say, what do you mean? Oftentimes, you and I fail and we uh, make the mistake when we fall or when we go on through something we make the mistake of going back to live on, living under the law. Y'all didn't get that. We think that God's goodness towards us is based on our good works. Rather than looking at the fact that God's goodness towards us is based on who he is. So we are our own worst enemy, and we go back trying to live under the law as if we need to keep A, B, C, and D, or if I messed up C and, and D, then I have to, uh, let me smack myself, let me, let me just be down on myself, and all these other things. That's how we live. And we're not living under the law, we're living under grace. Now, watch this now. That doesn't mean that we abuse the grace of God. But we just embrace and accept the fact that, guess what? Even on my best day, I can never be good enough. So I just have to make up my mind to just accept the fact that God has loved me. He's given his son for me. And I'm going to every day try to do the best I can but even on my best day, I'm still an unprofitable servant. 
I'm no longer going to allow the enemy to beat me up to say you ain't worthy, you ain't good enough. Look at what you've done again. Amen. Somebody, God already knows that. That's why he sent his son even while we were yet sinners. Don't you know it's no new thing to God that you and I are sinners? Well, I got I, I to gotta be good today. Well, God ain't going to be good to me. God is good to you all the time. And just embrace the fact that you can't be good enough. Amen, somebody. Does that mean that we are sinless? Oh, absolutely not. But should we be sinning less? Absolutely so. And why are we sinning less? Because God has been so good. You see, it's not fear that motivates us, fear of going to hell. It's love that motivates us. The fact that he loved me. Still can't comprehend why he loves someone so wretched like me. Amen, somebody. So that motivates me to try and live in accordance to his will so that I don't disappoint him. And when I disappoint him, amen, somebody, and we will disappoint him, when I disappoint him, I do what he told me to do. I confess it, I repent of it, and I ask his help to help me with me so that I can change to be more meat and fit for his use. Help me to get up, God. Help me not to stay down in, in my depression and in my despair. Help me to get up and serve you again today. Amen, somebody. Don't allow one day to turn into a week and a week into a month and a month into a year. Stop doing that. The devil is a liar. No servants in the kingdom of God because we're all on injured reserve. Some of y'all don't understand that sport. Amen, somebody. Well, I'm hurt. I can't play. Get off of injured reserve. Amen, somebody. Get into the game. Is that all right? He said, I got hurt on yesterday. So what? Patch it up and let's get back into the game. Let's continue to fight. Let's be about our father's business. Many of us are, are living in our brokenness. We're living in our brokenness when God has loved us to overcome any and everything. And we have the nerve to live in our brokenness. And that's why I always say, Lord, help me with me. Because I had to recognize, y'all, I'm just giving you my testimony. I had to recognize that in my flesh, I'll never feel good to doing God's will. And that's why I have to be filled with the Spirit. So even when this thing is saying, man, I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I'm discouraged, I don't feel like it. The spirit within me says, shut up. We're going to get up and we're going to do God's will anyway. And isn't it amazing when you obey the spirit that your flesh will follow? And your flesh that was tired when you first came to class is now rejuvenated. How did that happen? We're still trying to figure it out. We're looking for energy shots and Red Bulls when all we need is a dose of the word of God. And God has to teach us as long as you stay away from the saints, as long as you stay away from being edified, you're going to feel down. You see, it's not just about coming so that we can check off an attendance sheet. 
The devil knows we get strength, edification, just from being around each other. Just from being around people who are struggling and going through the same things I'm going through. That wasn't even a part of the letter. But we went there anyway. Is that all right? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 as we close. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 2. And this last point again, this is the reason. The reason why. The reason why is that he is the basis. Not us. He's the basis. And this is why he says at the end of verse 18, back in Micah chapter 7, he says he does not retain his anger forever because notice because he delights in mercy he delights in mercy I don't know no human being who delights in mercy who can't wait to forgive somebody Go ahead and use me, abuse me, do all that, persecute me, because I, I just can't wait to forgive you. Who is like God? He doesn't retain his anger forever. Some of us are still mad about stuff from 1979. There they go. They still owe me $2. Still mad. God does not retain his anger forever. And guess what? You and I better be glad of it. Because he has every right to be angry. Forever. Ephesians 2. Starting with verse 1. If you're there, say amen. As for you, you put your name there. You were dead in transgressions and sins. Is that what the Bible said? You were dead. And transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Is that all right? Guess what? We were slaves to Satan and we didn't even know it at the time. Is that all right? The spirit, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We look at this world and this society and we see all of this wickedness and this foolishness and this perverseness that's going on. And we're wondering why, understand that it is a spirit at work. And guess what? We used to be under the influence of it too. And, and truth be told, sometimes we still allow ourselves to be under the influence. Amen, somebody. You may not be driving under the influence, but some of us are still living under the influence. Well, I ain't got no DUI. Well, you got an LUI. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Is that all right? You say, oh, I would, that wasn't me. Look at verse 3. All of us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thought. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. In other words, if God would allow us to be killed at that time, he would have been just in allowing it. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive with Christ even while we were dead in trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. In other words, God saved a wretch like you and me so that other people can have some hope. This expressed and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse number eight. 
for it is by grace you have been saved, notice, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. And works here is works of merit. That's the point. So that no one can boast. Amen, somebody. Because if it was of works of merit, we would be boasting left and right. And we still try to boast, and we ain't got no reason to boast. For what? Watch this. For we are God's workmanship or handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here's the point. God delights thoroughly, delights and thoroughly enjoys extending his mercy and loving kindness. And therefore, therefore, instead of you and I giving up, get this, instead of you and I giving up and allowing Satan to have the victory over us, we are always to take full advantage of the second chances in which the Lord God gives. As long as you and I have breath in our body, we have a chance to be right with God. We'll never get to a point to where we say, living anyway, living as human beings, as long as the blood is still running warm through our veins, to where, oh no, I've done too much and I can't turn back or I'm not good enough, or whatever. I've done too much wrong. God still gives us opportunity. Who is a God like you? Jeremiah 3.12 says, Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return, faithless Israel, says the Lord, I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. So again, this third point, this is on the basis of who he is. No one can compare to God. No one is like God. Because his forgiveness and his pardon is because of who he is and not because we are deserving of it. Amen. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. Notice this. For my own sake. Did y'all get that? Let me read that again. I, even I, am him who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And remembers your sins no more. See, the basis is God and his love for you and I. A love so incomprehensible that he sent his only begotten son. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. So I ask you again, who is like Jehovah? No one. No one is like Jehovah. Amen, somebody. And he is like no one. He is God Almighty who loves us far beyond that which we can even imagine and understand. I've said enough. If you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want you to know 
that God loves you. You say, I'm not living a life that is pleasing to God. Amen, somebody. Neither were any of us. And that's why God gave his son even while we were yet sinners. You can come having heard the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Do you believe it? It's our part to believe. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Are we willing to repent of our sins? Except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are you willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Not be ashamed, not be afraid, not be timid. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then in obedience, be buried in baptism. Out of obedience. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Mark 16, 15 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you has, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Amen, somebody. Let us be mo mo mindful as we navigate throughout this week to take the time each and every day. Take a moment out of each and every day to consider what God has done for us. It will change our lives. It will change our lives. For those of us who have obeyed the gospel, maybe we're struggling, and you can't be in Christ and doing the right things without a struggle. Amen, somebody. But that's why Paul called it a good fight, a good fight, so that we can lay hold on to eternal life and not let go. Consider where you are as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement. Oh, how I love Jesus.